Welcome to Chapter 8, Connective and Muscle Tissue. Today we're going to be talking about special stains again, and we're going to be focusing specifically on, as, as the title suggests, we'll be looking at how to detect connective and muscle tissue in our specimens. And so the beginning of the chapter of the book that my trainees are using covers a little bit of the anatomy. We're going to leave that out just because I really want to focus on the special staining. I know my trainees have some background in anatomy. Um, if any of you are feeling a little bit out of the water here, absolutely get a hold of me and uh, we can set up a, a private training session and we'll go over that. Uh, if you're not one of my personal trainees, feel free to review your anatomy on connective and muscle tissue before going into this lecture. So uh, let's just start off by, by who cares? Why, why are we looking at connective and muscle tissue? Why is it important that we're able to detect this? Well, as with carbohydrates, uh, we're trying to find things either where they're supposed to be, so we're trying to figure out if the connective and muscle tissue, if the tissue is where it's supposed to be, or if we're going to be looking at something where it's not supposed to be. So are we finding muscle in a place where there shouldn't be muscle? Are we finding uh, a bunch of connective tissue sitting in a spot where there shouldn't be connective tissue? And that'll help our pathologist to come up with a diagnosis. Maybe a tumor is uh, connective tissue based, uh, maybe like a fibroma, something like that. Uh, and if, this can also serve as a way of gauging how far a tumor has progressed in an area. So at one point we were going, get, going to get into a, an elastic stain, and in some cases uh, you can have a layer of elastin, and if a tumor breaks through that layer, that can help the doctor determine kind of how invasive a tumor is, and kind of, kind of help with the grading of that. So that's why it's, this is important. I know it sometimes can feel kind of arbitrary uh, when we're doing these stains, but it really it really does help our doctors come up with those diagnoses. So let's just jump into the first one. That is going to be a Masson trichrome. And in my experience, this is a pretty ubiquitous stain. A lot of labs run it. Uh, some run it routinely on certain tissue. I know uh, we run ours on liver biopsies uh, fairly regularly. And so let's just talk about what we're going to look for in this stain. So trichrome, the tri in this, indicates that there's going to be three dyes used. Uh, sometimes th those dyes contain a nuclear stain, sometimes they do not. In this case it does. So we're going to get three colors. We are going to get black for all the nuclei. We are going to get red, and it's a pretty vibrant red uh, for all of our cytoplasm, keratin, and muscle fibers. So something along that line. And then we are going to get a very pretty blue for all of our collagen and incidentally mucin. And why I say incidentally is because, as we know from our last chapter, uh, if we want to look for mucin, we have carbohydrate stains that will find that specifically. But in this case, if there is mucin present, it will also turn blue. So what that means is when we're selecting a control, we don't really have to have something that contains mucin. It's kind of incidental here. So given all of that, given that we need to find the nuclei, some cytoplasm, so that's basically anything. It's going to contain all those things. Uh, but we also need keratin, muscle fibers, and importantly, collagen. Okay, and once again, mucin it can be there, but we're not really looking for that specifically. So we, for our control, in order to make sure that this stain works correctly, we need to be able to check all of those boxes. So what kind of tissue could we look at? Well, keratin is going to be found in any kind of epithelium, and then you need something with muscle and collagen at the same time. So you kind of need some connective tissue for the collagen, and you need to have something with muscle. 
So uh, maybe at first glance, you might think, well, you can get a really deep piece of skin that goes into the muscle, maybe, maybe something in autopsy, um, something like that. Uh, in this case, uh, a lot of folks will use liver. Uh, turns out liver has rarely available uh, large veins. And those large veins are going to have some epithelium, so we're going to have keratin to look at. Uh, they're going to have a thin layer of muscle, but it is present, so you have muscle. And they're going to have collagen also in those large veins. So that kind of checks all of our boxes, including, of course, our nuclei and cytoplasm mechanisms. Let's kind of uh, do our little sketch here so you can follow along. So here's our, our uh, space, and let's start with... Some of the, the venous structures. And essentially everything else around these is going to be hepatocytes. So a lot of times what you'll see is all of this kind of connected tissue here. And then you're going to see a few holes. Uh, we're going to see the little blood vessels here. And then everything here will just be hepatocytes, which you can draw outlines if you want. Uh, they're really not going to be all that important for this. So now we have our base drawing. Let's add a layer. And we are going to pick yellow because our first stain is actually something we use to preserve tissue sometimes, we use it as a fixative, and that is booing. So the very first step is uh, putting our tissue into booing solution for about an hour. And the, the thing with the Masson trichrome is a lot of the mechanisms here aren't that well understood. Uh, we know that they work. But um, it's not necessarily guesswork. We, you know, it's been verified to do what it's supposed to do. Um, but it, it's a little fuzzy as to particularly why we do each of these steps and why they work so well. A lot of it is thought to depend on the pH. So a lot of this stain will be done at an acid pH. And by doing putting something in Buin's solution, you are going to affect that pH by making it acidic. So <clears throat> when you put your tissue into Buin, it's going to turn yellow. Almost the whole thing kind of turns yellow, uh, looking at it grossly, uh, but specifically the cytoplasm and the muscle fibers will turn the kind of that yellow color. So after it's been sitting in Buin, you're going to go ahead and take them out and rinse them. Um, and we're just going to kind of undo the coloration that we've done here. Uh, which also kind of leads credence to the whole idea that it's about the pH and affecting the uh, pH of the tissue rather than the coloration done by the Buin. So we're just going to wash all that off. But the, the tissue has been treated in some way that allows for further staining to be a bit more selective uh, according to literature. So after we've washed all that off, the next thing we're going to do is treat it with Weigert or hematoxylin. And as we know, Weigert is often used to uh, create stain, nuclear staining that can withstand uh, pretty harsh conditions. And given that we have a trichrome here, so we have at least two more stains coming along, it seems like a pretty good idea to use Weigert. Uh, of course, the difference in Weigert is the nuclei tend to be a bit more uh, darker, so it can be kind of a black color compared to the purple that we're used to seeing with uh, other hematoxylins. So I'll just throw in some nuclei there. They probably won't be this prominent in other things, but just so we know that they're there, uh, the hepatocytes will be a bit more prominent than uh, the rest of the connective tissue because it's all going to be pretty dark once we're all done. So after we've put everything in Weigert, uh, we're going to wash it off. Uh, to get uh, any of the excess out of there. 
And the next one we're going to use is uh, the Beebrick Scarlet. So I'm going to add a layer here. And so it's going to be kind of this, this red, or as the name implies, Scarlet. So it ends up being pretty vibrant, uh, depending on the section. But I'd say right around that kind of red is what you're going to see. So, uh, as we know, th this is going to stain the cytoplasm, the keratin, and the muscle fibers red. So, in general, all hepatocytes are going to be So all of the hepatocytes are going to be kind of this red color. Let's go. Get rid of this spot. That's my bad. Okay. So we've gotten most of the cytoplasm of our hepatocytes. Now, when it comes to the uh, the venous structures here, um, at this point, you're not going to see that much of it, uh, just because these tend to be um, these portal veins have a fairly thin layer of smooth muscle. There's just a lot of collagen in there. So if you wanted to, you kind of Pencil in some red there, and it would be right around there, and also the keratin. So that's why we're gonna kind of get the insides of these, and that's a pretty good control for that. Is the endothelium has has epitheliums essentially and that's going to have a uh, keratin that we can really count on being there okay so uh, essentially so when we're doing the bubric scarlet everything's going to get hit with red it's one of those that uh, shows up and then we kind of have to uh, get rid of so a uh, kind of a regressive stain in a way uh, and the way that we do that is with phospho Molybdic phosphotungsic acid. That's one you probably want to remember. Uh, it's pretty, uh, it's going to be used in connective tissue an awful lot. And so when you're looking at this grossly, you're going to, let's say this is your section. Okay, so your section here and it's hanging out on your slide. Um, when you put this in the Beebrick Scarlet, you're actually going to see it uh, differentiating as it's sitting it, or as it's sitting in the phosphotungsin phosphotungsin acid. I'm sorry. As you watch it, it's actually going to differentiate in front of you, and it will kind of disperse into the uh, into the solution. And essentially, this is something they think the pH once again has something to do with this. So. Uh, the collagen fibers are going to kind of let, let go of the Beebrick scarlet, where as the the nuclei of the, the the rest of the hepatocytes in this case are going to retain it, um, kind of due, due to their permeability of their membranes, but the the collagenous fibers are not going to have that same kind of uh, lack of permeability, so they're going to kind of let go of the uh, Beebrick Scarlet. And so what you're left with is a bunch of unstained collagen, and if there's any mucin around, then the mucin is also unstained. So we have almost everything except for nuclei and any kind of muscle and keratin are, are covered in, in the Beebrick Scarlet, and everything else is kind of unstained at this point. So that's why we didn't uh, color in this entire thing with red. It's because this stuff is unstained by the phosphotonic phospholytic acid. Now, one thing to keep in mind 
with this stain is you will not rinse after the phosphotungstic phosphobenzoic acid. Do not rinse after this. Um, it could have something to do with the pH, once again. Uh, it could be that just the, the acidic environment makes the next step better, but uh, in every procedure that I've seen, you're told to do not rinse after this step. It just doesn't work as well. So uh, with that being said, our next step is to use our aniline blue. Uh, now this can also be substituted for a light green in some cases. Uh, I believe aniline blue is fairly common. So this is just going to get all of our collagen. which we'll see in here. I feel like I'm getting the texture pretty close to uh, what you'll see on a slide as far as the the collagen tends to be kind of that almost looks like a watercolor painting in a way. Uh, now it can be more vibrant or less vibrant depending on your, your staining procedure, but that's essentially what you're going to see. So you're going to see some some muscle here, and you're going to see some epithelium. Uh, one thing you can look out for to to check the quality of the stain is if you're just getting epithelium and no muscle, you know that there's something wrong. Uh, I believe that the, the more likely situation there is that you just get epithelium and there's no muscle staining, so there might be something wrong with your beadwork scarlet. Um, but yes, yeah, so that's, that's one way that you can use this control to check for that. And now, as far as the control itself, if your control doesn't work out, uh, these components are present in a lot of things and may be present in your patient tissue. So you might actually have an internal control to work with. So if your positive control doesn't work out, you might be able to get an internal control off the patient. And at that point, it's up to your pathologist whether they are comfortable with passing it or not. Um, so don't, don't fret too much. Maybe your control falls off the slide. That happens sometimes. Uh, if your control falls off, check the patient and see if you can see all the different constituents and check with your pathologist and see if they're comfortable with that. It's possible that you can actually find all of these things hanging out in your patient. And so that's, uh, that's it. Uh, after that, as far as the coloring, that's pretty well done. And then uh, we can put that into acetic acid, which will just kind of get rid of any of the excess uh, aniline blue. And at that point, it's completely done. So uh, that's your Masson trichrome. So pigric acid, pigric scarlet, differentiate with phosphotungstic phospholinic acid, put directly into the aniline blue, and use some acetic acid to uh, differentiate that. And you're done. So this one is, like I said, it's pretty ubiquitous. You're probably going to see it uh, many times during your career. So it's, it's best to get really comfortable with it and definitely get comfortable with how it stains because this is some low-hanging fruit on an exam is just knowing what stains what color so you might not even see a, a picture of a slide they might just ask you what color is keratin and Masson trichrome that's that's an easy one so be on the lookout for that and let's move on to the next stain and our next stain is the Gamori one-step trichrome And it's a bit of a misnomer, I feel, uh, because there has, are, in fact, a few steps with this. Uh, the one step in this is referring to kind of taking the last few steps that we did in the Masson trichrome and condensing them into a single step. But there's still a bunch of all the ones before that. So uh, it's a little weird. But so essentially, this is going to be used to differentiate, for the most part, between muscle and collagen, just like we were doing before, um, except you're kind of condensing some steps. So 
uh, pathologist might might like one or the other. There's not a lot that speaks to the effectiveness of Masson versus Gamori. Uh, it might just be an efficiency thing. I guess if you're running a bunch of special stains all all day, um, maybe getting rid of a few steps is going to be really important. So let's talk about this a little bit. Uh, so the first thing we're going to do is mordant and buins like we did before. Uh, then we're going to use Weigert again for our nuclei. And we get to that step after that, we're going to put the, the slide into a Gamori stain, which contains phosphotensin phosphalimidic acid like we had before. So that's going to affect the pH. Uh, that is also going to have glacial acetic acid, which will further affect the pH. Um, the tensic acid specifically is going to affect the collagen which is going to allow for the collagen to take up the, uh, depending on what you're using, it could be light green or it could be the um, aniline blue. In this case, let's just assume we're gonna use a fast green, uh, just to give you something different to look at. And the the difference here in the the muscle stain is going to be, instead of Bibrex Scarlet, we're going to use Chromotrope 2R. So it's it's pretty similar. Uh, it's going to look fairly similar. If we use Aniline Blue, it would look very much like the Masson Trichrome, uh, except we're just going to uh, put some steps together. So let's go ahead and take a look at that. Uh, in this example, why don't we use a different control? Just because we just because we can. So let's say we are looking at a maybe a, a big vein. So that's something that could happen. We could have a a large vein, and it's going to have just you know, collagen fibers hanging out here. If you've ever seen these on an H and E, um, you know they're pretty isonophilic. And actually, it's kind of hard to tell what's muscle and what's collagen. When you're looking uh, at an H&E, they'll both be pretty isonophilic. They tend to be different shades sometimes. Um, but if you really want to know what's muscle and what's collagen, then you might want to run this stain. So we'll just say there's just kind of a mass of connective tissue, a bunch of fibers here. And we don't know what's what. So we're going to run our Gamori 1 step and uh, see what kind of fibers are contained in this uh, patient specimen. So like I said before, we're going to use Buins. So we're just going to it's going to make everything yellow briefly. So everything's going to be yellow. Then you're going to rinse it with uh, the distilled, which will remove it, but it is still effectively treating the tissue and preparing it for staining. So the next thing is going to be our Weigert again. So we're just going to do aspen nuclei. Uh, because this is connective tissue, you know, you only see a few fibroblasts hanging out different places. So you're not going to see a whole lot of uh, nuclei when you do this on a specimen such as this one. Um, so after we do all that, so we do our Weigert, we wash it out, we're left with just our, our nuclei. Uh, then we're going to throw it into our, our one-step solution. So, so far we've used Moons, we've used Wagger, then we're going to use our one step. And our one step in this case is going to use uh, Chromotrope 2R, which is kind of a red color, a lot like our Barber Scarlet, really. So, it's going to be like that red. And then uh, let's use a, let's use a light green. Like I said, just to, Give you something else to look at. But the red and green uh, have contrasts, and that's important. So whether you used a, a red and green or red and, and blue, 
uh, the important thing is that the two things have contrast so that when the pathologist looks at it, that they, they're able to distinguish between the two. So let's go ahead and it really doesn't matter in this case because uh, what we pick, because they all look pretty similar under the scope. So whatever you decide is muscle in this case is muscle. I'm going to pick a few over here, and maybe one here. Okay, so there's a few muscle fibers. And remember, this is happening simultaneously in one step. So, actually, that's kind of a neon green. That's not really what light green would look like so much. Be a bit darker than that. There we go. Maybe a fibroblast here. So all of this is just kind of happening within your Copeland jar all at the same time. And in the, the text I'm looking at, it's saying 15 to 20 minutes. Uh, I'm sure that's going to depend on what your individual lab uses, but that's what mine says. And then after this, just like we did in the Masson, we're going to use acetic acid to get rid of any excess. And that's going to leave us with our finished stain. So the important part here is that we can see the difference between muscle and collagen. Um, if we had any keratin here, we can also tell the difference between that and collagen. And you're going to see a few nu nuclei hanging out. Uh, so I would say that when you're doing any of these, the fact that you can tell the difference between the different constituents is the most important thing. So if you're looking for quality, you want to be able to tell what's what. So this stain is fairly simple. We're going to first stain with Weigert again because it, uh, it will resist any subsequent staining. And then we're just going to use Van Giesen uh, because it turns out Van Giesen tends to differentiate between collagen and muscle. So that collagen is going to be a bright red, and muscle is going to be more of a yellow color. So if we were to do this stain first, we would have our, I'm not going to draw a background for this because there's not a lot to really look at. Uh, so you'd, you'd see your nuclei after using the wire curtain, washing it away as normal. And then when you hit it with the Van Giesen, we're going to see something similar to what we saw with the Gamori one step, where everything kind of happens at once. So we are going to see red for collagen. So let's put some collagen fibers in here. You'll most likely see a lot of. But then you will also see it's kind of a, it's not really a bright yellow. These would be all the muscle fibers. And once again, when you're picking a, a control for this, anything that contains both of these, which is a lot of things, will work. Uh, you can use something like fallopian tube. You can use uterus. Um, you, know, you can still use liver. It's really going to be up to the pathologist as to what they're going to be most comfortable looking at would be my suggestion. So yeah, when it's all done, then you know, depending on how how loose or compact your connective tissue is, this might be just a bunch of red and a little bit of yellow. Um, it's really going to depend on the, the control. But the important thing is that we see the differences 
between the differences between our muscle and our collagen. And this can be a little bit confusing because when we were looking at our uh, Masson trichrome, things were a little bit different because our, our muscle was that red and now it's just this yellow color. Um, but so yeah, if, if you have to run this or if you see it on the exam, this is what you're looking for. So this could really uh, trip you up when you're studying. Just remember that the Van Gies and Empiric Acid uh, Fusion is a little bit different when it comes to um, the color of the muscle and the color of the, the collagen. The next thing that we're going to look at is the Verhoff Elastic Stain. Now the Verhoff Elastic Stain is notable not only for its use in identifying elastic fibers and tissue, but also as a technician, you're going to find that this, this stain will really test your staining technique uh, because this stain is regressive. So we're going to overstain, or we're going to look for elastic fibers, and then we're going to differentiate and kind of de-stain those sections so that only the elastic fibers are showing. And it's really easy to uh, to take away too much stain, so to over-differentiate or to not differentiate enough. So when you're doing this in real life, it's, it's a stain that's going to take a lot of practice, and I, I really recommend doing it the first few times with a technician there so you can kind of check with them to see how you're progressing. Uh, because after you do it for a few times, you'll develop an eye for where you should be, and you'll get a sense for the timing. Uh, so let's just kind of jump into that. So the, the elastic stain is going to rely on kind of an overstaining with a solution of uh, ferric chloride, iodine, and hematoxylin. And so the way this works is elastic fibers are going to have the highest affinity for that hematoxylin, which will be so dense that it'll, it'll look black on the slide itself. So what we're going to try to do is stain everything with hematoxylin, and that hematoxylin is suspended in that mordant, which is both the iodine and the ferric chloride are acting as mordants for this. And by adding excess mordant in the form of ferric chloride, we're going to get rid of the things that don't have as high of an affinity. So having too much mordant can kind of de-stain things, and we're going to use that to take the hematoxylin off of the things that don't have the high affinity. So anything that's not an elastic fiber will kind of give up its hematoxylin into that mordant and be washed away. So when we're drawing this one, you're most likely going to use a control, something like an aorta, uh, something that's going to have sort of continuous elastic fibers around the outside, and you'll see them kind of in layers like this. Um, and I find that that one's kind of easier to differentiate as well. It's really it's really easy to tell when you get the, the correct endpoint. Um, but because this is such a, a touchy stain, you're not only going to have to differentiate your control correctly, but you'll have to differentiate the patient correctly. So you're going to have to know what the patient looks like at the correct endpoint. So given that, it's really important to know what doctors are likely to order the stain and what do they usually order it on. So I've seen this on things like lymph nodes, I've also seen it ordered on skin, and I've also seen it on lung. Um, so it's really important to know what they're looking for and being able to know where the elastic should be so that you know that you've hit the right endpoint. I'm going to see how we differentiate both of these because it's going to be a little bit different. The technique's going to be the same, but the endpoint is, is going to be a little bit different because the, the patient is a bit more tricky than our control. So these are our bases. This is kind of our base drawing. Let's add another layer. And 
in our procedure, what we're actually going to be doing in lab itself, is we're going to put our sections into our Verhoff elastic tissue stain, which is our hematoxylin, ferrochloride, and Lugol iodine. So it's essentially just hematoxylin and mordant. And we're going to let that in there for, for a long time, uh, typically an hour is how long this takes. And so by the end of that, it is just going to be all very, very dark. So let's see. Oh. I mean, very, very dark. Uh, you know, when you go to wash it off, it's going to be, uh, it's just going to be everywhere. So, and when you pull it out, you, you do wash it in a bunch of distilled water to get rid of anything that's not necessarily hanging on there, but it's going to be super dark. You're not going to be able to really tell what anything is. Um, so the next point is to differentiate our sections. So like I said, we're going to use ferrochloride, and we're going to use a, a fairly dilute amount. So the uh, my text indicates we're going to use 2% ferrochloride. Some folks might even use a more dilute amount. Uh, and how you do this differentiation is, is also going to depend on your laboratory. Some places are going to recommend that you do this in a Copeland jar and just sit it in there for an amount of time. Some folks might want you to put the, the ferrochloride directly on the slide and kind of watch it differentiate. That part's going to depend completely on, on your lab itself. So let's say it's in there for a little bit. I'm just going to, actually it's not going to be nearly that abrupt. So I'm actually just going to trim a little bit of this off. So let's say you got through your your first differentiation. It might look something like this. Okay, it might might say, well, okay, you can kind of see some of the uh, some of the fibers and and you might be tempted to say oh, okay well you know the fibers are there we're done but, but of course we're not um, so let's say so yeah you might say oh you know I can see these here there's a few fibers there we're, we're good to go no um, so we have to go quite a bit farther. To to get to the, the point that we need to be. So let's keep going. So you put it in for another another set. And yeah, your control is looking pretty good. And maybe you're just starting to see a little bit of the uh, what you're looking for on your patient. So let's say this is the, the line of elastin that we're looking for. Uh, and you're just starting to see it here. So at this point, I would say you, you got to keep going. Um, there's there's some gray there. And it's, it's almost going to be impossible to get rid of all of the uh, all the hematoxin that's not supposed to be there, but it needs to be more clear than this. So you just keep going. So this can take a few passes. It, it's really, like I said, it can be just very, very touchy. Now, at this point, you're getting close. You're getting close to what you should be seeing. Now, hopefully, whatever procedure you're using in the lab is a lot faster than this, maybe one, two passes um, before you start getting to this point. And what I mean by that is that you're able to see individual, individual sets of elastin, and they're continuous, which is very, very important. 
you need to be able to tell that this is one continuous piece. Um, so it's not broken up by excess, like around here, where it's kind of the, the excess hematoxin is kind of in a way. You want to see continuous pieces, and you want them to be clearly delineated. So here, like that's getting pretty close. But I would go just a little bit farther. And it's going to be kind of cheating because, uh, you know, it's a paint program. But kind of back to where we were when we drew them. So but like I said, the important thing here is that we're able to see these continuous lines in the patient as well as in our control. So the important thing here is that when you're doing this elastic stain, you're doing you're checking for two things. Your control is essentially seeing if the stain works on a mechanical level. So does the mechanism do what it's supposed to do? Is it staining elastic fibers? Yes. Uh, though your control can't actually tell you that much about your differentiation because how much you need to differentiate the patient is going to be, term be determined by the patient tissue. So you d differentiate your control as much as you need to to see your control, but you need to differentiate your patient separately and to the point where you can see your patient correctly. So you want to be able to see this whole piece here. Now granted, it could be kind of broken up. If it's a piece of skin, you might see some guys like this. Or if it's uh, maybe in a lung, you'll see just like a squiggle like that. And the important thing is that you just want to see that complete squiggle, and you don't want to see a bunch of, of kind of hematoxyl and dust almost surrounding it. You don't want any shadows. Now, let's say you got to this point, and you forgot you didn't take it out in time. There is the possibility that you can over differentiate this. So you might end up seeing, I won't be that, you might end up seeing some of this going on where all of a sudden it's no longer continuous. It's just kind of there, and you'll see it on your control too. But like I said, it's going to be different. Um, you know, the endpoints are going to differ between your endpoint on your between your, your control and your patient. But if your control starts looking like this, then it's pretty good indication that you're either close to too far on your patient, or at least it's too far for your control. So this control is no good. Um, these are no longer continuous lines where they should be. And so that means that you've over-differentiated. You've actually added so much mordant that the elastic fibers are giving up hematoxylin, and that's no good. You can't have that. Because at that point, the pathologist is going to be looking for elastic, and they're not going to see it. And that's very bad, because sometimes they might be looking for a tumor, and they're going to see if that tumor is... intersecting with this elastic, if it's broken through that elastic or not. So if there's a break in the elastic, it's not supposed to be there, that could kind of indicate that the tumor has gone past that line. Um, but if, if it's just that you've over-differentiated, you might also give that impression. Now, granted, this isn't the only part of this, of this stain, which is going to correct for that a little bit. So we're going to counterstain this. So after we're done differentiating, let's say, let's say we did it all correctly, and we have a nice line here, and these are all nicely connected and continuous. Um, there we go. Good. A nice, nice complete squiggle there. So let's say everything's good on this. Then our next step is a Van Giesen. So as we know, uh, Van Giesen can differentiate between muscle and collagen, and it's a pretty decent counterstain for this. Um, so we're just going to hit that with Van Giesen. There should should be kind of that. 
that yellow color. And that's just to kind of show where the rest of the connective tissue is relative to the elastic. And this, of course, is going to differ in your patient tissue depending on what, what it's made of. Um, but you should see that, that yellow there for uh, kind of the, the other things. And then the, the, any kind of collagen is going to be sort of that, that red color. And you might see some muscle uh, can be that kind of yellow color as well. But things that are uh, collagen is going to be kind of a a red color. Everything else is going to be yellow. So if this is a And depending on the artery, um, a muscular artery is going to have a lot less collagen in it. Um, you're going to see some. So you might see some red in there. That's mostly going to be yellow. Uh, you're most likely going to see if this was if the patient with a skin, you're going to see a bit more red on the, the collagen. But you also see the yellow that we were using before. And, and the good thing about this countersane is it doesn't affect the elastic at all. It, it really doesn't. Um, as long as you don't leave it in there for too long. The epicric acid can affect it if you leave it in there for too long. But for the most part, this is pretty, uh, it pretty much leaves the, the elastic alone. It provides a decent contrast and just kind of shows the other uh, constituents of the, the tissue. So, uh, yeah, so to kind of go through the actual steps themselves, it's your Verhoff elastic tissue stain for a long time, typically an hour. Differentiate with ferric chloride. Uh, then you're going to use some thiosulfate to kind of get rid of the, the excess, and the, kind of the dusty parts. And then you're going to use van, van Giesen for your counter stain. And that's pretty well it. It's a pretty simple procedure, but like I said, differentiating with ferric chloride is, is really... Uh, it's an art. It's something that you really need to work with and do over and over again before you uh, really get a handle on it. So, you know, ask your other techs for help. Ask people to look at it. Ask your docs to look at it uh, when you think you have a good one. And, um, you know, they, they know what they want to see. So uh, definitely practice this stain. And obviously, you know, don't, don't forget the technical parts. That's the parts you're going to be actually tested on. But in, in an actual laboratory, it's more about the technique of this and uh, less about remembering the procedure. The next thing that we're going to look at is an aldehyde fusion elastic stain. So that might seem kind of weird seeing aldehyde and fusion in the, the same stain because when we did our PAS, we were looking for aldehydes and we used a, a kind of fusion to detect them. And uh, it turns out that in this stain, something kind of weird happens where these things are put together and uh, shift bases are made, except in this case, instead of attaching to uh, carbohydrates, uh, they attach to elastic fibers. And the mechanism for this it isn't very well known. Uh, we just kind of know that it works. So uh, in terms of the procedure, it's pretty similar to how we did our Verhoff elastic. Uh, we're going to stain it in our primary stain, which is aldehyde fusion. And then we're going to rinse it instead of with water, we're going to rinse it with 70% alcohol. So in this case, our alcohol is going to be our differentiator. And so when we're looking at the slides, if it needs to be darker, uh, whereas 
in the other scene, we would go back into our Verhoff solution. We we're going to hit it with the 70% alcohol and put it back into our aldehyde fusion solution to darken it. Um, in order to get to differentiate it more, we just use 70% alcohol, whereas before we were using ferric chloride. So instead of using a mordant, we're using um, a solvent to to take out some of the stain. So in that way, it's it's pretty similar to our last one. Uh, we still have to differentiate, so we still have to be very careful with both our control and our patient tissue to make sure that they're both differentiated correctly. Uh, but the coloring is much different. So let's see. Say we had a piece of skin here, and we did our aldehyde fusion. And the elastic fibers in this case are going to be between a deep blue and down to kind of a purple. So we're just going to kind of go somewhere in the middle there. And if this is a skin, you're going to kind of see them here. So if you got it right in the first time, first shot, um, that's kind of what you would see after the primary stain is done. So you just see just see really per perfect um, fibers here. Uh, if we did not do it perfectly, you might see kind of a, might be too dark, might be too thick, I might have some extra stuff hanging out there, uh, in which case we would have to hit it with the 70% uh, alcohol to get rid of all that extra. Just kind of clean it up. Uh, one thing we do not have to do is use sodium thiosulfate. So kind of all the extra dusty looking things are removed just with the alcohol. And so when you know that this is it reaches endpoint, then you just hit it with distilled water, and that'll stop the whole reaction. So um, or in the analogy we've used on other things, you know, you're just kind of adding a, a layer to that. So this reaction is done, and then we're just going to hit with a counter stain. And the counter stain, uh, in this case, you can use a, a light green. So in this case, it ends up being kind of a kind of an ocean blue, but it's it's enough contrast that we can still see those fibers. So if we're looking at something like this, yeah, I might get a little bit darker down here because we're gonna have some, some collagen floating around. And then epidermis can get really almost overcolored with, with some of these things. Um, yeah, that's essentially what you'd see if you did this on a skin. And if this is what you saw, then you did a really good job. Um, this is, is pretty pretty standard for an aldehyde fusion. And once again, you're going to have a, a patient and you have your control. You have to make sure that both are differentiated correctly. And just because your control looks good doesn't mean your patient does and vice versa. Uh, and your control is just to see if, in this case, if the elastic fibers are attracting the aldehyde fusion stain and not whether they're actually uh, differentiated or not. Uh, for our next stain, we're going to look at uh, one of the, in my opinion, one of the, the most beautiful stains. And unfortunately is one that I have not had a chance to do in person, but I've read about them a lot. And this is the Russell modification of the Movat pentachrome stain. So we're just gonna call this the Movat pentachrome. Sometimes you'll see, uh, Russell in parentheses, sometimes it'll be Russell dash Mobot. Um, yeah, be ready for any of those on the, on the exam. I, I feel like the nomenclature depends on uh, depends on who's who's looking at it, really. But so so the interesting thing about this is we're going to use the attributes of all the things that we're looking for, and 
we're going to use a bunch of different stains in a particular order that allows us to look at all of them. And so we're going to be looking for mucin, fibrin, elastic fibers, muscle, and collagen, all in the same stain. So So in this stain, uh, this is really an exercise in our mechanisms and kind of layering reactions and knowing what reactions nullify other reactions and avoiding that. So we have to do this in the correct order so that when we do you know, step four, that it doesn't nullify step one. Uh, we also have to know that all these reactions can be stopped so that when we're done, let's say, uh, staying our mucins, that when we go to stain something else that we're not affecting the stain on the mucins. So so yeah, so essentially what we're going to do is we're going to stain our uh, acid mucous substances, our mucins, with Alchem Blue. So and get that, uh, or it can be kind of a brighter color sometimes, depending. So somewhere in there. Is our mucin, um, and then we're going to use our iron hematoxylin for elastic fibers. So just like our Verhoff, uh, that's going to stain our elastic fibers that, that black color. I'm sorry, that's our elastic there. Then we're going to use uh, Crotian Scarlet to essentially stain everything at first. So kind of everything is this red color. Uh, but then we're going to use Phosphotoxic Acid to remove things we don't want to stain. So things such as collagen and ground substance are going to be de-stained by this, and that just leaves our muscle and fibrin. The fibrin tends to be a little bit more intense, uh, and our muscle is, is a little bit less of a red. And then that just leaves our collagen. So we're trying to uh, stain collagen. We're going to use alcoholic saffron, and so that saffron is going to turn our collagen yellow. And so uh, with this, you can see why it's a pentachrome. It's going to be uh, blue, a bright red, black, kind of a more of a muted red, and then yellow for our collagen. And so this is a really handy kind of stain if maybe if you need to see the difference between all of these in, in a patient tissue, maybe you're unsure of what the, the tissue is and what the, the makeup of the maybe a tumor or something, you're trying to figure out what it's made out of then a mobile pentachrome can kind of show um, your doctors uh, what kind of uh, tissues are, are present. So let's go through it. Let's just kind of start from the beginning here. And we're going to do this on a section of colon. So we'll just kind of get Get some villi there, and we'll just assume that we went deep enough to uh, include muscle and some uh, blood vessels down here so we can get the elastic portion of that. Actually, I'm going to erase these because they're not gonna, they are going to be black anyway. So first things first, we're going to perform our Alchem Blue. So we are going to hit the goblet cells here with our Alchem Blue. Except that is not Alchem Blue, that is not the color we're looking for. There we go. Which we're already familiar with this. Here we know what this should look like. 
all of our nice goblet cells here are going to be lit up by the yellowish and blue. And maybe we'll get lucky, have some some mucin kind of hanging out there. Okay, so that's step one. Uh, so we, we put them in alcohol blue, we uh, wash them off, then we're going to hit them with some alkaline alcohol. And then we're going to use our iron hematoxylin. So that is going to kind of turn <clears throat> this whole thing pretty dark, except for the uh, goblet cells, because they already have a stain kind of hanging out in them. So that's going to stop uh, some of that uh, hematoxylin from binding uh, after... Uh, after we wash it off. So, primarily, that's going to stain elastic fibers, so down these blood vessels here. We have a few, there we go. Uh, so, and that's of course after differentiating them. So we, we've hit it, we've hit it with the, the ferric chloride differentiated Sodium thiosulfate to get rid of any of the, uh, the junk there, the, the iodine dust. And then we wash that in water to stop that reaction. Okay, so we're adding another layer. And we've, we've now done two reactions. We've done two levels of staining that have, uh, haven't really affected each other. And so the next up is our uh, scarlet. So it's going to be... That red. And that is going to get kind of everything first. So, yeah, that's collagen, fibrin, muscle. All right, so we're going to see a good bit of muscle here. And then let's say, just so we know what we're getting rid of, initially this collagen's gonna light up too. Okay, uh, but when we go, when we hit that with the phosphatungstic acid, that is going to get rid of the collagen. That's just gonna leave us with the muscle and the fibrin. So that's actually pretty perfect. You're going to see just some fibrin chilling out there, but the collagen is now decolorized. Actually, let's get the, this with a bit of a brighter red so I can really see the, uh, the fibrin. That's actually, yeah, that's a pretty good distinction. So the fibrin looks a lot brighter than the, the muscle there. So we've differentiated that. We're going to hit that with acetic acid, which typically stops our, our uh, phosphatoxic acid reactions. And then last, we're going to use our alcoholic saffron, and that's just going to give us our, our collagen back. And that's it. And honestly, I mean, the drawing is mostly just for demonstrations. When you do this for real, it looks it looks like a painting. It's really a gorgeous stain, and it's much better than I could ever draw. But the important thing is, what we've done here is a bunch of stains on top of each other without interacting with each other. So everything has stained correctly, and we've stopped those those stains. Uh, usually by rinsing with something. So this really demonstrates kind of the core of what special staining is, and that's staining the things you want and being able to stop it and then staining the other things you want without affecting each other. And uh, yeah, the, the Movat pentachrome really, really demonstrates that well. So just to recap, we are using Alcian Blue, and we, uh, we stop that with water, hit with alkaline alcohol, then we do our elastic stain. So we use our... our uh, Iron hematoxylin, differentiate that with ferric chloride, uh, get rid of the excess iodine with sodium thiosulfate, stop that reaction with water. Then we use crochet scarlet, differentiate that with uh, our phosphatonic acid, 
and then we do an SA8 rinse and slough that with absolute alcohol. And then we use our alcoholic saffron for the last step. Uh, go ahead and get rid of the excess with absolute alcohol and just put this directly into uh, silane. So yeah, that is our Movat Pentachrome. I've never done one in person. I would assume that it's probably kind of touchy. There's a lot of steps here. So anytime you add a step that is a, a possible uh, place of error, and maybe it's just kind of over the top for what uh, pathologists really need. It might be just a bit busy and a little bit uh, resource intensive as well. But if you ever get a chance, uh, yeah, they're really, it's really a gorgeous stain. Our next set of stains can be thought of as kind of a subsection within this chapter. We're going to be looking at silver techniques. And so essentially, instead of depositing a dye in or on top of the things that we want to see, we're going to de deposit silver and eventually a, a gold, uh, metallic gold onto the substance in order to make it visible. And within the literature, <clears throat> there's a variety of techniques that can be used. And those, those techniques still need to be known for those of you that are getting ready to take the, the HT or the HTL. Um, but when it comes down to actual practice, there's really a, a couple of methods that are, that are really the most reliable, and those are the ones that we are going to cover in this. So just, uh, so kind of as when you're studying, you're going to have to know all of them. So that's going to include uh, Snook, Gordon and Sweet, Gamori, Laidlaw, Nasher and Shanklin, and Wilder. So you're going to have to know all of those techniques and be able to know what the reagents are and the steps. Uh, but, I said, but for practice, for those of you that are, that are mostly learning, uh, just so you can uh, practice in the laboratory, uh, Gamori or Gordon and Sweets are the ones that you're uh, probably going to stick to. And those are the ones that you're most likely going to see in your laboratory literature anyway. Now, silver techniques are, are very, uh, very picky and Sometimes they don't work the way that you think they should. Even if this is your your hundredth silver stain, uh, they can be just just very tricky and, and kind of finicky. So it's really important to know how to do the stain in the way that your laboratory does it. So being able to replicate that method every time is very important, and being able to keep all of the the variables in kind of the same same place. So essentially what happens uh, for silver technique for reticular fibers is it's going to be uh, somewhat like what happens in a PAS, um, but, but, but only, but only um, kind of on the surface. So we're going to start by oxidizing our fibers. And so and that's typically done with something like potassium permanganate, um, periodic acid, so, you know, uh, kind of how it uh, ties into the PAS, um, or phosphomolybdic acid. Next, we want to uh, sensitize the, the tissue, which is kind of like a, um, kind of preparing the tissue to receive the first impregnation metal. So sometimes you're going to use um, urinal nitrate, uh, ferric ammonium sulfate, or um, dilute silver nitrate. So we'll just get to the uh, sensitization step. And then after that, we have the actual impregnation. So at this point, we're introducing uh, silver. So uh, it's a monocle or, or diamine silver. And because it's already been sensitized, uh, the silver is readily uh, taken into the fiber and kind of replaces that first group that was put in to sensitize it. So next, so that's our impregnation. And at this point, <clears throat> all of the, uh, the silver is where it's going to be, um, but the but it's not all that visible. So when you're looking at the slide by itself, you'll likely just see uh, 
the outline of your tissue. It might be just a little dark on there, but you're not going to see much of anything at this point. And it's not until you get to reduction that this actually gets to be dark. Um, and that's done with formaldehyde. And so you'll see it turns like a gray, like a grainy kind of gray color. And that's essentially, um, it's making the, the metal precipitate. And so now it's actually sitting on top of the fibers in a way that um, that's not in solution anymore. So we can actually see it. So then the next step is the toning. And what we do with toning is uh, we treat the slide with gold chloride. So what that does is it kind of changes the coloring. Uh, so when we're doing the reduction here, it can be kind of a brown, brownish gray. And during toning, it turns dark black. So that just makes it even easier to see. So when we went oxidation, sensitization, you can't see much of anything. Impregnation, you see a little bit. Reduction makes it a little bit more visible. The toning changes the color of the what was deposited there by changing the uh, the metallic silver for the uh, for gold. And at this point, you have metallic gold sitting on the slide. So after you tone it with your gold chloride. Uh, then you re remove anything, any extra silver that might be hanging out with uh, sodium thisulfate. And that's just to get rid of any of the excess, excess silver. Sometimes if you leave it on there, it'll be kind of grainy. And if you leave it in any kind of UV uh, or sunlight, then uh, it can actually develop. You can get those grains can be a bit more pronounced. So you just want to get rid of anything extra that's not on there, just like any other stain. Just want to get rid of the extra. And after that, then you just counter stain. So, uh, so you have your oxidation step, and you have your sensitization, which kind of gets ready to receive the silver. You have your silver impregnation. You have a reduction. Sometimes that's called developing. You might hear, hear that used in your lab or, or in your text. Uh, after it's developed, then it's toned, so that replaces the silver with gold. And after that, we hit with the sodium thiosulfate to get rid of any extra silver that might be hanging out, and we counter stain. So that's essentially it. That's, that's uh, on a uh, mechanistic level, that, that's what's going on in these stains. So the first technique that we're going to look at is the Gomori. Uh, stain for reticular fibers. Uh, in, in the Gamori stain, we are going to use potassium permanganate as our oxidizer. And then when we, after it's oxidized, we'll dif uh, differentiate in uh, potassium added by sulfate, sulfite, uh, and that essentially gets rid of uh, the, the excess potassium permanganate. <clears throat> And so what you might see on your slide is the potassium permanganate can kind of turn it, turn it to like kind of this color, maybe like a yellowish or brown, something like that. And then putting in the potassium metabisulfite uh, just clears that away. So uh, after that, it should be mostly back to a uh, translucent color. So now that we have oxidized, then we are going to sensitize with uh, ferric ammonium sulfate. So as you, as you can guess, it's probably the iron in that that is going to be the, the, the sensitizer. So we're kind of adding iron to, to our tissue to kind of get it ready to uh, receive silver. So you're adding iron as kind of a placeholder. And then once we wash that off, then we're going to use our ammonical silver for this one. So so at this point, that silver is going to get rid of 
the iron, and it's going to take its place. Now when you're making this up, it's very, very important that you get the solution to look however your lab wants it to look. Um, folks have different opinions on what your medical silver should look like because it's your solution of silver nitrate and potassium hydroxide uh, kind of swirling around here and you need to keep the solution uh, swirling so either with a stir bar or something else um, I just kind of move the uh, the actual jar around by hand and you need to slowly add a silver nitrate solution dropwise until eventually one of those drops will make it just cloudy and that's usually a point where you want to stop just follow whatever your lab says as far as that goes. So we're going to put our slide into our medical silver, which is replacing our iron, and that's going to be deposited on there. Like I said before, this might not look a whole lot different. Um, you're not looking at the slide itself because the silver doesn't have that striking uh, difference in, in color. It's not until we um, it's not until we precipitate the silver again that we'll actually see any kind of difference. So that is our next step. So we're gonna put that in formalin. At that point, it should be markedly dark, but also still a little bit brown. So it depends on where it's at, but it should be darker, it should be more pronounced. It'll actually show up. Um, and then when you put it into gold chloride, all any of the brown spots should turn an actual uh, dark black color and it's at this point that you can start to look at the slide under the microscope and and start to see if you've done things correctly uh, at this point you should be able to see all of your reticulin fibers so let's say we're doing this on a liver uh, which is pretty typical so those reticulin fibers are going to kind of hold together packs of hepatocytes. So when you're looking at that kind of branching pattern that you get with hepatocytes, you're going to see the outline of that. And it's really, uh, it kind of just looks like somebody drew it in pencil a lot of times. So you're just going to see outlines instead of individual cells. Um, you're just going to see these reticulin fiber outlines around the hepatocytes. Now at this step, there's going to be a bunch of little dots because we haven't gotten rid of the excess silver. So you might see some precipitate in there. Um, don't worry, you're probably okay. Um, once you put it into the uh, potassium metabisulfite and then sodium thiosulfate, then those should go away. If they do not, then your uh, silver, your medical silver might have been made incorrectly, might have had too much precipitate sitting in it. Um, or you just might have to redo this. Sometimes if you just let it sit in the sodium thiosulfate long enough, it'll kind of get rid of things that aren't there right off the bat. Um, sometimes putting in the gold chloride can put uh, put gold in the places where the silver is and just kind of moves things around enough to get rid of those precipitates. Uh, like I said, this is a very, very touchy stain. So uh, especially, it's, it's kind of like the elastic. You really have to do it around another tech a few times. To, to make sure that you're doing it right and doing it according to how your lab likes it. As I mentioned, this can be a really finicky stain. One of the things that you might run into is at some point you might have your Copeland jar here and you put a slide in and all of a sudden it gets murky. There's just, there's black precipitate all over the place. Um, or maybe it happens when you put a solution in there Chances are, if it's instantaneous like that, one of two things happened. Either your glassware had contamination, so if there's metals hanging out on the sides of your Copeland jar, then they're going to react in this. Um, remember, we're, we're very careful about how we're replacing our different metals here. So if we have metals that are kind of out of sequence, so if you have silver sitting in there, when the iron goes in, then that's going to be a problem. If you have gold hanging out there, then it's kind of uh, things have to be done in sequence or else you're just going to have metals floating all over the place in the solution. And that leads to uh, inaccurate deposition. So if, if the solution gets cloudy, then it could be the glassware. It could also be that you're using metal forceps, which once again, when you're introducing 
metals into this, it has to be the right one. So when, uh, when working with this, make sure that you're not using metal forceps. Um, you know, use plastic, use anything that's been decontaminated before uh, doing any kind of silver stains. Uh, because that, yeah, that contamination can really, really mess the whole thing up. Now, another thing to keep in mind is that we're doing something very basic. So we're using a lot of ammonia and things like that. So because this reaction acts at such a basic pH, um, our tissue is kind of in trouble if we don't use charged slides. So I think it's kind of a general practice to use charge slides for any kind of special or immuno stains in a lot of labs, but it's especially important anytime you're doing something with a basic stain, because if you put a slide that's not charged into a basic solution, sometimes the, uh, the tissue can actually fall right off the slide. So that's another thing that you have to watch out for. Now, as we move on to our next stain, I'm actually going to keep all the drawings up here um, because visually things are pretty similar between these two. So uh, the next one is the Gordon Sweets. And so in this case, we are going to use potassium permanganate as our oxidizer. Uh, we're going to use oxalic acid uh, to get rid of any uh, excess potassium permanganate. So then we are going to use ferric ammonium sulfate as our sensitizer. So that's where we get to add our, uh, our iron to it. And then we are going to, once again, um, we're going to use our ammonical silver solution. Uh, specifically in the Gordon and Sweets, uh, in, this is the one where we are going to put the silver nitrate in a flask, and then we're going to add sodium hydroxide, and then just keep uh, keep adding sodium hydroxide until just you get a little bit of a cloudiness in here. And that seems to be what, what the text is going for, is you kind of want a cloudy solution without any visible precipitates. And, but once again, it, it's really going to come down to your lab as far as what, uh, what you're really going to be looking for there. But after that, so we're going to put that, our slide into our medical silver to get rid of our, our iron. So now it just has a coating of medical silver. Then we are going to do our development in formalin. So at that point, it's going to get darker as it precipitates. And then we're going to hit our gold chloride, which is going to replace our silver with a darker gold. And after our gold, we're going to use our uh, potassium thiosulfate. Um, no potassium metal by sulfite in this one, just straight into sodium thiosulfate, and that'll get rid of any excess silver. And after that, you're ready to, uh, ready to counter stain. And uh, the pretty popular one there is nuclear fast red. And so yeah, these uh, these techniques both uh, work pretty well, and it's it's like I said, it's a lot like the elastic stain. You just have to do it a lot uh, to really get a handle on, especially on how to make your medical silver. Our next stain is going to get into the muscle part of of this chapter, and this is the Mallory. PTAH, that's a phosphatoxic acid hematoxylin. And it's a technique for cross striations and fibrin. So uh, why you might need this stain uh, is because if you're looking at something like a rhabdomyosarcoma, then the, uh, the, the pathologist might want to look for the striations. So uh, the tumor itself might actually have striations that they're looking for. And this stain itself is a, referred to as kind of a, a polychrome because you're using a one solution, it's going to give two different colors. But it's really easy to remember what all is in it because it is just uh, phosphatonsic acid and hematoxylin is in the main part of the stain. Um, one thing to note 
is that it works really well if you use Zenker as a fixative, but of course we know that Zenker also contains some pretty nasty chemicals, so chances are you're probably not going to have that in your lab. Um, we can use Buin, and if you use Buin, then you don't need to use iodine when you're doing the, the steps that we're going to use to uh, kind of undo some of the things that the the fixative does. So this this stain is more, it's almost more about getting rid of the effects of the fixatives as it is actually staining. So let's say we did it in Zenker because that's kind of the standard. Um, so let's say we started with formalin and so we had a regular formalin fixed tissue but we have to use Zenker to make the this stain actually work well. So we're going to place our section that was previously fixed in formalin into Zenker with 5% acetic acid and just leave it overnight. Um, so when you come back in the morning, you rinse it off in tap water and you use iodine and the sodium thiosulfate to get rid of the mercury pigment. Of course, you gotta be super careful with the zinker itself because it's really, really bad for you. Um, then we're going to put our sections in potassium permanganate. So that's actually you know, part of the stain process here. Um, we're gonna use oxalic acid, so this looks pretty pretty similar to some of our um, silver stains. And then we are going to use um, the phosphotensic acid hematoxylin solution. And it's thought that the, the solution actually makes a dye lake and the, the hematin in there with the phosphotensic acid uh, tends to uh, attach to the, the striations in the muscle or the fibrin if you're staining for that. And then the phosphotoxic acid itself goes after the collagen and turns a kind of a brown, brownish color. And so what you're going to see, if uh, if you got a section that you're supposed to get, which is typically a, a longitudinal section of muscle, so you want to get them this way rather than, than like this, rather than a cross section, you want to get a longitudinal section of muscle, and it's going to be that, that hematoxylin purple or blue, depending on how you want to look at it. Um, and then you're going to see, essentially, you're just going to see like this. So you'll start to see the, the striations of the muscle as you're going longitudinally here. And that's, a, that's essentially it. And then any kind of collagen hanging out around the uh, around the outside is going to get that kind of a um, a reddish brown color. So if you have any collagen out here, then it's yeah, it could look a little bit like that. Maybe a little bit more on the red side. Yeah. So you might have some collagen hanging out here, but the muscle is really the part that you're you're trying to uh, to display for the pathologist and those, those striations. But once again, you can also use this for for fibrin if that's something you're trying to to show. Uh, but I, I think that typically uh, what they're really looking at is muscle striations. So our next stain is going to be used to stain basement membranes. Uh, so you're going to see, uh, sometimes you'll see the Jones technique. Um, this is actually a modification of that. But um, if you're looking at something on exam, it's probably going to be a Jones basement membrane. So that's most likely the term you'll see on a multiple choice. But so, and attaching them with methamphetamine silver, and then we'll go through the rest of the staining like we would with any other silver stain, where we tone it and get rid of the excess with sodium thiosulfate, and then counter stain. So it's a lot like our other ones, um, except the the technique is a little bit different, and but it's similar in that it's also very very touchy. So for instance, the the text I'm looking at is made for a specific amount of slides in a Copeland jar. So by that, you can, you can tell that the available surface area for reaction matters. Um, 
you're going to get the solution to be very hot because this is a microwave technique because the, it is a modification of the Joe invasive membrane. So uh, the microwave technique is thought to be a bit more effective and it's supposed to show cleaner lines. But the, the, the end goal here is to be able to see the basement membrane of a glomerulus kidney. And it really should just kind of look like this, except maybe without the extraneous line. Uh, it really should look like it's kind of drawn on there, like a lot of other uh, silver techniques. Except this one will specifically sand the glomerulus uh, really well. And you'll also get some of the internal con constituents there. But the most important thing is this basement membrane. So you might get some of these. The other uh, convolute tubules will still show up, but those are not your um, those are not your controls for this. This is the uh, the membrane itself, the basement membrane is what you're really trying to look for because that's what's going to be important uh, diagnostically. So, as I said, we're going to uh, oxidize our aldehydes. So we're going to use periodic acid, just like we would in at PAS. And then we're going to place our slides in our uh, methamine silver solution. And that is going to be put into a microwave. So a lot of times uh, you would use a plastic Koblen jar and you want to vent it a little bit. So uh, the reason for that is that you're going to have a liquid heated in a microwave, so you're going to be building up some pressure. Uh, so you need that to vent just a little bit so it doesn't explode. And uh, the reason this is very tricky is because a microwave has to be calibrated, uh, or at least the, the amount of time you put in the slides in there has to be calibrated so that the exact temperature is reached uh, that you're looking for. So that's kind of where, where things get a, a little weird with this one. Um, but if you have a very well-controlled microwave, then you shouldn't have a problem. You take them out of the microwave and uh, you rinse them in some, some heated distilled water just because you don't want to shock the slide with cold water, it might break. And then you just want to do like we normally would, you tone the sections with gold chloride, replacing that silver with gold, making it a little bit darker. And then you uh, treat those sections with sodium thisulfate to get rid of the excess silver. And the counter same with a light green is the uh, is typically the one we choose for that. So go ahead and add that. But by this point, we already know kind of what that looks like. Well, certainly not like that. So something along that line is what you'll see in, in a kidney that's that's well stained. So this counter stain isn't as as important as the uh, glomerulus and the basement membrane there. And that's essentially what you're looking for. As I said, it can be really finicky, and a lot of the the trouble that comes with that is just calibrating that microwave. So this is a little bit different from our other stains where your technique was uh, really relevant and and maybe. Um, how well you differentiate something or how well you make a solution is the big problem, but this is more instrumentation, which is something you still need to know as a tech. You need to be able to, to calibrate your instruments so that they perform the same way every time. Because if something uh, if something is, is weird with your machinery, then that could show up in the patient tissue as well. It could lead to, uh, could really misguide your pathologist. The next stain that we're going to take a look at is oil red O. So we're going to look at a few lipid stains for a second here. So oil red O. Is. Going to use the principle of solubility to get a dye into lipids specifically. So we're going to use a fat soluble dye. And because the dye is fat soluble, then it will be taken up by uh, fat droplets. So that will allow us to visualize any kind of adipose cells, which can uh, determine what a tumor is made of. Um, you can also tell if there's fatty liver, that sort of thing. So that's why you might be asked to use an oil red O. Now, in order to perform an oil red O or any kind of fat stain on tissue, 
um, you still can uh, fix the tissue in formalin. So fixing the tissue in formalin allows the, the structure to stay the same. Use embedding, uh, paraffin embedding for this because doing that will, will kind of move the, the fats around too much and it will kind of just displace it. So we want to use frozen tissue that was previously fixed in Form 1 it is pretty, pretty good uh, for this. Now some folks will do straight from, uh, straight from frozen without using Form 1 and you do lose some of that fixation that comes with, uh, with using Form 1 first. So we wanted to get our, our frozen section, which was uh, uh, fixed in Form, form 1 uh, beforehand cut that and then stain it with the oil red o first so that's the very first thing we do is hit with the oil red o and it will look a little something like that okay so you're going to see a bunch of little droplets where the where the, the lipids are so here here and these are kind of free floating uh, that's uh, what makes a stain a little bit difficult is because you have sort of free floating droplets here um, any kind of organic solvent that comes into this is going to wipe them out even pressure from a cover slip is going to move them and that's not what we want uh, so we're just going to wash this in water and then we're going to use hematoxylin to get any kind of nuclei And then uh, once it's the same with hematoxin, we're going to blue it. And then when we go to mount it, we want to use an aqueous mounting solution. So your normal per mount is going to destroy the, the fat droplets here. So you need to use an aqueous uh, mounting solution. And then when you put the cover slip on, you just have to lay it on there. You can't push down or anything like that. Um, so say this is your, your slide and you might want to do the kind of the tipping technique which is usually what I did when we uh, hand cover slipped um, just kind of let let it fall and uh, or you could do something that you just kind of like put at the top and let it fall flat on it however it works best for you you just can't move these around too much because a uh, pathologist might be counting on them being in a certain area um, so yeah, so that's essentially it. It's it's pretty easy stain. Uh, once you actually get the tissue ready, it's more or less just getting the tissue prepared without having it embedded first. Uh, it tends to be kind of an issue. Now our other fat stain is Sudan Black. So let's get rid of this. It's going to be fairly similar in terms of uh, how do you use it and uh, everything else. So this is Sudan. Now with our oil red O, all of our oil droplets are kind of this red color. As you can imagine, Sudan black, they're going to be uh, kind of a black color. So you're going to see something like that on the slide. Um, the, the difference is not only the color, but also the uh, sand black also stains phospholipids. If that's important to your pathologist, that might be something that they're looking for. And uh, but yes, essentially everything's pretty much the same. You stain with Sudan black. Uh, the only difference here is you differentiate with 85% propylene glycol. So there's a differentiation step and not just a rinse. And then after that, you counter stain and you're good to go. Um, same deal, you want to use an aqueous mounting medium and just be really careful with putting that slide on there or that cover slip. Our next technique is one that demonstrates fat in formalin fixed tissue, but tissue that can also be processed and embedded, which is definitely a plus, and also can be subsequently stained. So the oil red o and Sudan black is essentially you got that stain and maybe a counter stain, that's it. Um, this is actually going to stain the tissue. You can do an H&E, or you can do a Masson trichrome on that same piece of tissue. It's it's fine. It's not going anywhere. 
And this technique is using osmium tetroxide, which you're probably familiar with from our fixation chapter. And so what we're going to do is you're going to do the, the formula fixation. So essentially the tissue is going to come out from the PAs and then you're going to go into the osmium tetroxide. So in, before you put it into the processor, you're going to actually treat it with the osmium tetroxide and then process it like normal. Now, once it's out of the processor, then you can embed it. But there's a big difference between this and, and routine tissue is you have to cut it as soon as possible. And by, by as soon, I mean as, as shallow as possible. So you can't trim into it too far or else you're, because the t osmium textual oxide only goes in so far. So this is your block. You might have uh, some of this is osmium textual oxide treated and the rest of this is no good. This is all just going to be blank for osmium tetroxide oxide and therefore blank for fat staining. But once you get those sections, then you can do whatever you want with those. You can do, do an H&E, or you can do any kind of subsequent staining with those. So that's kind of why we use an osmium tetroxide. oxide. Um, it's a little bit of work, but if you really need those fat droplets to be demonstrated, then this is a good way to do it. Now we're almost at the end. We just have a couple of kind of miscellaneous stains that are in connective tissue. Uh, the first is toluidine blue. And toluidine blue is used to stain mast cells. So uh, the way you do this is, well, for your control, you have to have something that's mast cell uh, positive. And this is a metachromatic dye. So very, very simple in terms of uh, the actual procedure. You're just going to place your slide in toluidine blue solution and then rinse it and cover slip it. You know, run it through your alcohols and cover slip. That's it. Um, the mast cells themselves, particularly around their membrane, is going to be kind of a deep purple. And sometimes it'll make its way into the cytoplasm too, of the purple part. And then everything else is just kind of a light blue. So even the, the cytoplasm here and the area around it is going to be kind of that blue. Um, so yeah, this is a metachromatic dye. So the mast cells are that purple and then everything else not a mast cell tends to be this blue color. That's pretty well it. It's pretty simple stain. Uh, it's just one to keep in mind, especially if you're studying for the exam, that uh, it's one you might see. Just remember that it stains mast cells and they are purple and everything else is blue. And the last one that I want to mention, and I'm really just going to mention it because we've gone over it already um, in nuclear staining, was uh, methyl green pyridin, uh, methyl green pyridin Y. And uh, that's because uh, in addition to differentiating between the DNA and RNA, um, it can also stain plasma cells. Uh, so, and you might find that in connective tissue. So it's just something to keep in mind. Um, if, you're, if you forget how to do that one, just go back to nuclear staining. Uh, we did go over that. But uh, that's essentially it. Uh, as far as connective tissue and muscle tissue, uh, if you're trying to practice this and kind of get a, a grip on what stains what. If you can get everything for a, a, a Movot pentachrome, I would do that. You know, it's, it's a great review of some of our uh, carbohydrate stuff with the Alshin Blue in there, and it gives you a real idea as to how all this works. So if you can kind of explain how a pentachrome works, how you're able to do all of those stains on top of each other without them interacting, then you probably have a pretty good idea of how the rest of the staining works. So uh, thank you for listening and uh, have a good one.